Welcome to the Blue Envelope channel. I'm Phil. I was on the uh, XGW subreddit just recently and uh, somebody had posted a post about, hey, do you know any rich witnesses that you knew when you were in the truth, quote unquote? And, uh, and so there are different stories people are sharing. And that kind of got me thinking, hey, why have I never done a video on Judah Ben Schroeder yet? And so he was the son of Albert Schroeder of, of the governing body. And um, he was one of the only, if not the only little kid born and raised at Bethel itself. So it's a pretty interesting little life that he's had. So I thought maybe I'd talk about that a little bit today. So just to rewind, to go back to his parents, um, as I mentioned, his dad is Albert Schroeder. So Albert Schroeder. He was born 1911 in Saginaw, Michigan, hometown of our favorite boy, uh, Anthony Morris. Woo -woo. So yeah, they were both from there. And Albert's grandma was a Bible student, but his parents were not Bible students. So there was an interesting little dynamic going on where his grandma was studying with him and getting him really into the Bible student uh, religion. And then at the same time, his parents weren't into that at all, and they just wanted him to have the regular you know, do well in school, go to college, kind of route in life. So there's this competing philosophies a little bit. But yeah, so evidently he was a good student. He got a scholarship to uh, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And so even though he he wanted to be a Bible student and do that whole thing, um, he in the end he agreed with his parents that he should go to college. And so that's where he went. And uh, he mentioned that he studied a few different things. He said uh, electrical engineering, economics, Latin, and German. So I'm not exactly sure what his major was. I'm assuming electrical engineering, um, but not positive. And uh, I don't know, that seems kind of cool. Like in 1929, electrical engineering must have been kind of like a cutting edge new uh, field to get into. So that's kind of neat. So yeah, he went there starting in 1929 also the year of the big stock market crash and the start of the Great Depression, as it happened. And so he went to school, and it, as it turned out, the, the landlady at his boarding house was associating with the Bible students. And then, um, I think it was in his sophomore year, one of his housemates uh, that moved in was also a, it was in the Bible student uh, movement. His name was Bill Elrod. So he, even though he was at college, he had a lot of still association with the Bible students, and uh, they would go to assemblies and stuff. Um, so anyways, they got more and more into it to the point that Bill and Albert agreed that they would stop going to college after their junior year finished, and they would um, start pioneering instead. So that would have been 1932, so they left after their junior year there. Yeah, and so none, he, they, he got three years of college, but he didn't complete his bachelor's degree. So uh, they both started pioneering, and then almost immediately, both Bill and Albert were invited to um, go to Bethel. And so that's what they did in the fall of 1932. And uh, so it's really interesting that uh, I think Bill kind of had the normal experience at Bethel, but for whatever reason, Albert just had like this meteoric rise through the ranks of the organization. Uh, he was almost immediately placed in the service department, like within a couple of weeks. And we all know the, the service department is like the breeding ground for future governing body members. So yeah, I'm not sure if it was like the education that he had had that made him so appealing or if he had natural abilities in leadership or if it was just like he was super loyal to the to the ones taking the lead in the organization. Um, so I'm not sure what the secret sauce was. Maybe it was like a combo of all three of those things. But at any rate, he did really well and kept progressing. So he was in the service department. And then in 1936, uh, Rutherford sent him to be the uh, branch overseer at uh, Britain in the UK. And... Uh, <laughs> Rutherford said, furthermore, this means a one-way ticket, agreeing to stay there until after Armageddon. So here they're thinking, pretty much thinking in terms of months left till Armageddon, not years anymore. So, but despite that, uh, Albert said, yep, let's do it. 
And uh, so he took off to England and became the branch overseer. Um, so he served there for a few years until he got deported because um, he wouldn't serve in the army. So he was sent back to Brooklyn Bethel. And uh, so then in 1942, Knorr picked Albert Schroeder to set up and run Gilead, which was going to be this brand new missionary training school, college. Um, and the campus for Gilead at that point was going to be at Kingdom Farm in South Lansing, New York, a little bit outside the city. And so Albert was the one that kind of spearheaded that whole um, getting that set up. And so he became the registrar for Gilead, and he taught classes as well. Um, so he, that kept him really busy planning the curriculum and whatnot. Um, his obituary that was in the Michigan newspaper when he died, it also mentioned, it said throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, Schroeder frequently lectured on religion and sociology at Cornell University, which was not far from South Lansing. So that's kind of interesting. So that's what he was doing in that time period. Now, to move to the next phase of his story, we have to back up for a second and jump over to Nathan Knorr's story. Um, and the story is that in 1952, Nathan Knorr, the president, noticed this attractive young housekeeper at Bethel. Her name was Audrey Mock. And for whatever reason, that year, something clicked in his head. So Nathan Knorr had also, he was also a person that had had a pretty meteoric rise through the organization. And so now at this point, he's president of the society. He's president of this large multinational publishing corporation. It has dozens of branch offices and uh, factories around the world. And at the same time, kind of related, he is the head of this religious movement, which has like a million followers. And they're all they're going to do anything he would like them to do. So that's uh, pretty. So he had a lot of stuff going for him, but there was one thing that he didn't have, and that was sex. So he had always been single. And for whatever reason, this thing clicked in 1952 when he saw Audrey and she kind of sparked this awakening in him. Now, the problem was that you could not be married and be at Bethel at that time. So even even if there were two Bethelites at Bethel and they wanted to get married, they could not stay. They had to leave. And that was just the rules back then. Um, but when it's the president of the Watchtower Society that wants to get married, well, then the rules start to become surprisingly flexible. And Nathan Knorr was allowed to get married when he wanted to. So he got married to Audrey in 1953. Audrey was 15 years younger than he was, and Nor wisely recognized it would be quite hypocritical if he said, hey, I can get married, but none of the rest of you can get married. So, uh, so now there was this policy change at Bethel, which was that Bethelites with a lot of seniority, a lot of years in at Bethel, could now get married. Um, in the 1960s, the minimum buy-in was 14 years of full-time service between the two, uh, between the man and the woman. So, so that was the new policy that started in 1953, and now this started to create options for Albert Schroeder. So he was a single guy; he'd been at Bethel a million years by now, and uh, so he had the seniority, and he's uh, twice a year at Gilead. He's seeing these new groups of students come through and many of the students at Gilead were young single women they're very spiritual and attractive and uh and the gears started kind of clicking in his head so we jump forward to 1955 and he's at an international convention in Rome Italy and he runs into a young witness woman named Charlotte Bowen and as it happened she was a student from his very first class of Gilead and she had gone on and served in Spanish fields. She was currently a missionary in El Salvador. So they kind of reunite at the convention there in Rome. And then when they get, when Schroeder gets back to America, he evidently he tells Noor somewhere along the line, hey, I'm, I'm interested in this uh, sister, Charlotte. And uh, wouldn't you know, Charlotte, before too long, is reassigned out of El Salvador and reassigned to Kingdom Farm, 
so that Albert could, and I don't know what the term is here, could stalk her, pursue her, court her. <laughs> I guess it depends on your perspective, but it seems a little bit creepy that she was like brought in for him. But anyways, I, you know, it, I guess it worked out. They ended up getting married uh, in August of 1956. So, uh, Charlotte, again, there was a little age difference. Charlotte was nine years younger than Albert was. So they get married August 56. By April 1957, Charlotte is pregnant. So this is the late 50s. There's no birth control pills yet in the U.S. There's just They were just working with condoms and diaphragms, basically. And so evidently there was a little uh, mechanical problem somewhere along the line there, and she gets pregnant. So again, we're running into a major problem here. So now marriage is allowed among Bethelites, but now, I mean, there's no way that a couple with a baby are going to be allowed to stay at Bethel. And in fact, the Schroeders knew this from personal experience because Charlotte's parents had been in the circuit work when they got pregnant with her. And, uh, you know, that, that was it. That was the end of the circuit work. They were gone. And so this un, basically unwanted pregnancy really sent Albert and Charlotte into uh, a spiral of depression, is what Albert writes. Um, it was going to like ruin their life, basically. But uh, Albert writes that Fred Franz was the one that encouraged them. He said, you haven't sinned in making the womb fruitful. He said, take courage. It may be that Jehovah will arrange for you somehow to continue in the full-time service. And he wasn't really like prophesying anything because he was helping to run the society with Nathan Knorr and the other directors. And so he kind of had the inside scoop. And uh, But yeah, basically the rules, again, proved to be surprisingly flexible for certain people at the very top of the organization. And so Knorr and the others in France decided that, hey, the Schroeders can stay at Bethel. Albert is a really, we need him to run Gilead for us. This is so. This is really interesting. It's a. It's even more interesting to look at the contrast between Albert and Charlotte versus what happened to Albert's old pioneer partner, his housemate Bill Elrod. So Bill had gone to Bethel too, and this is kind of a weird story. But Albert kind of picked out a student, a woman from the seventh class of Gilead, for Bill. Uh, it was a woman named Edwina Fountain, and so, anyways, he kind of like hook them up or whatever you want to say. And so they got married around 1947. Um, so initially they were pioneers because they couldn't be a Bethel. But then in 1953, the rule change was that, you know, now you could be married at Bethel. And so they were accepted back into Bethel and they were there about five years. And then in 1958, they got pregnant just like Albert and Charlotte did. But unfortunately that rule bending didn't apply to them like it did to the Schroeders, and the Elrods were asked to hit the road and leave Bethel. So anyways, uh, Albert and Charlotte have this baby, and uh, that was 19, February 1958, and they name him Judah Ben. Uh, at this point, Albert is 47, Charlotte is 37 when he was born. So uh, the name is interesting. They, they picked the first name Judah, and as you read through, you know, the Bible, Judah was kind of like the number one guy, the number one son of Jacob out of the 12 sons, the 12 tribes. And he was like over all the other sons and had a lot of good prophecies about him. And uh, King David and Jesus were from the tribe of Judah. So it was like a, a power name that they gave him. And then Ben is a Hebrew word, which means son or son of. So literally you could say Judah, son of Schroeder is what his name was. So that's kind of interesting. So they were allowed to stay at Bethel, but they did have to move out of Kingdom Farm where they were living. So from 1958 to 1962, they lived in this small apartment nearby so that Albert could still commute and do his thing at Gilead. And then in 1962, the society built the Schroeders a house about a mile from the Gilead campus, and they would live there about five years. Um, now, so Albert was allowed to stay at Bethelite. Charlotte was Charlotte had to leave Bethel. She was no longer a Bethelite until Judah was ten years old. So, and that put like a real crimp on them financially, um, because now they're down from 
two Bethel stipends to a single Bethel stipend, and yet they've gone from two people to three people that they have to pay for. The math didn't really work good. And so is the program from Charlotte's funeral reports that it was actually necessary for her to start working secularly during this period just to make ends meet. So she was taking care of little Judah and had to go to work while Albert was teaching. Now, in 1959, uh, the society invented a new school called Kingdom Ministry School for Elders. And so that was also started at Kingdom Farm. And then Gilead, meantime, was moved down to Brooklyn Bethel. And so um, Albert was, again, tapped to run this new school, the KM School. And so he stayed at Kingdom Farm to do that. Um, In 1967, the society kind of wanted to start phasing everything out of Kingdom Farm and kind of start looking at liquidating that property. Um, And so KM School was also moved down to Brooklyn. And so that's when the the Schroeders moved down to Brooklyn at that point. Now, so so this is around 67. And so you've got um, Brooklyn Bethel doing their thing there. You've got Gilead School going on in Brooklyn. And now you got KM School going there as well. Plus, remember, this is just starting the pre-1975 buildup. So there was like tons of new Bethelites coming in to um, work the presses and, you know, because they were trying to run them 24-7. There was so much literature being moved. So but, uh, <laughs> Brooklyn Bethel was getting really crowded. And so basically in 1968, KM School was moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for a while. And so the Schroeders moved to Pittsburgh. And that's, so that's where Judah Ben spent. So basically, this is Judah's fourth home in 10 years. So he had to move a lot. Um, and they would live in Pittsburgh about six years. Uh, 1968 was also when Charlotte was allowed to rejoin the Bethel payroll and become a, a Bethelite again. Um, so they were down there, um, let's see, six years in Pittsburgh. There's a comment on jehovahswitness.com. Uh, one of the posters mentions he was, he attended KM school in that period, uh, in Pittsburgh. And, uh, he has a memory of, uh, they were at breakfast one morning and Elbert brought Judah in and he kind of had him do this like performance thing where he would recite, uh, watchtower passages from memory and uh, so that was kind of something he remembered. Okay, so in 1974, eight members were added to the governing body, and Albert Schroeder was one of those eight. Uh, interestingly, Ewart Chitty was another one that was added in that group. So uh, at that point, Charlotte and Judah Ben moved with Albert back to Brooklyn Bethel, where the governing body was. Um, Judah was 16 at this point. And Albert specifically writes, he says, the society invited me to become a member of that body and also invited my wife and son to serve as members of the Brooklyn Bethel family. Judah became a Bethelite at 16 years old. So I think that's probably the youngest Bethelite ever in history. So that's kind of interesting. And uh, so his parents would stay at Bethel the rest of their lives. So uh, Albert died in 2006 at age 94, and then Charlotte died in 2013 at age 93. So that was what happened to them. Now, Judah was a Bethelite for 12 years. So from age 16 to 28, he was at Bethel, um, and then he got married. So, uh, And the reports are that he was a pretty low-key guy at Bethel. He wasn't like uh, trying to ride on his parents' coattails at all. Um, He was a waiter there at Bethel, nothing special. Um, And yeah, it seems like a pretty easygoing guy. I don't know. It just seems like a, is reading through what, what there is about him. It seems like he grew up spending a lot of time with his parents and maybe not so much time with other kids, just the way things were. So But anyways, he grew up, you know, still level-headed is what it seemed like. Um, So in June of 86, he married a witness woman. Uh, Her name was Amber Baker. The Watchtower describes her as a lovely pioneer sister. 
So it's interesting that despite his 12 years at Bethel, he evidently was not allowed to bring a wife into Bethel at that point. So I don't know if they were overstaffed in 86 or what the deal was. But anyways, even with his connections uh, with his dad, he that was a no-go. So he had to leave Bethel to get married. Uh, and so Albert, in his life story in 1988, two years later, he writes the two of them now pioneer in Michigan. So we can get a little more specific. Amber Baker was from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, we know that she graduated high school in 1982. There's a publication from her 25th class reunion uh, in Grand Rapids. And uh, so it mentions, indeed, she you know graduated in 82. So that would put her born maybe 64, 65. So a few years, maybe you know, six, seven years younger than um, Judah. And uh, it gives us a little bit of information. It mentions that she graduated top 10 in her class. Uh, she was a student council representative. She was also one of the ladies of the court at the winter dance that was held. So interesting, definitely had some extracurricular activities going on, although she was also a regular pioneer after she graduated. So an interesting mix there uh, going on. Now, her father, as far as we know, is Dale Baker, was his name, and he owned the sizable car dealership in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, and so it was just called Dale Baker Oldsmobile. So he started that in 75. He later added Isuzu and Hyundai uh, to the dealership. And so we have this press release from 2001 it describes that, that in that year, the dealership was sold to an investment group for an undisclosed sum of money. So that was the deal there. And actually, it seems that the Watchtower Society used Dale Baker's dealership to get its lease cars for the circuit overseers. So that was like a major chunk of his business for a while. Now, eventually, the society formed their own circuit leasing division to kind of do it directly and kind of cut the middleman out. So that's how that worked. So, but at any rate, it definitely seems that the Bakers were <laughs> far more well off than the Schroeders ever were. Okay, now in her, uh, so she writes like a little bio, uh, as all the students did in this 25th reunion um, pamphlet. And so she gives us some good information. She mentions that they're living in Brooklyn. Um, she gives the address as 228 Henry Street. So this is a five-unit building in Brooklyn Heights. It's not owned by the society at that point, but it's very close to the society headquarters. Um, if you look at it now, it, the rent runs about 4000 a month there, which sounds like a lot, but then again, maybe that's like normal for <laughs> New York City. Um, but she writes that at that point, it, so this is 2007, that they'd lived, she'd lived in Brooklyn longer than she'd lived in Michigan. So if you kind of do the math, basically it seems that it's not too long after they got married, a couple of years after that, they must have moved to Brooklyn. Um, and it's not super clear what they were doing kind of between that 1990 and 2005-ish time period. I mean, there's definitely hints that Judah was was back in Bethel, and so they were Bethelites maybe, or commuter Bethelites or something. Um, there's hints that maybe he was working in the media and the public relations department at Bethel, but nothing for sure that, that they were in Bethel at that time. She does write a little bit. She says, I work as a buyer and continue to volunteer my time with Watchtower. So maybe that is an indicator that they were at least commuter Bethelites at that point. But uh, anyways, at any rate, she writes that at the last um, at the last class reunion, which I guess would have been the 20th, so in 2002, five years earlier, um, she writes that her, both her and Judah were starting classes at Columbia University to finish their bachelor's degrees. So that is very interesting. Columbia is a private Ivy League University in New York City and is super expensive at uh, currently, it runs about $65,000 per year before financial aid for the tuition. So crazy expensive. So I'm not sure what was funding their their college experience, whether it was the Baker family or if Bethel was paying for it. I don't know. But 
At any rate, they were both going to Columbia, and so now at the 25th anniversary in this in 2007, she could write that both of them had graduated from Columbia. So Amber had her bachelor's degree, and, and Judah had his, but then he was continuing on to get his master's degree in human rights. So again, I'm not sure the connection with Bethel, whether they wanted him to get his master's and then work at Bethel with that, or what the scoop was, but... Um, Anyway, so she mentions that they, they were hoping to move to Brussels, Belgium, so that Judah could work in the human rights area there. Okay, so that was 2006, 2007. Um, we have another data point in 2007. This is uh, that Judah had a public talk that was recorded April 1st, 2007, that he gave in Brazelton, Georgia. Unfortunately, that link to the recording itself, the MP3, is dead. But so we just know that he gave a public talk down there. Okay, now we jump forward to 2009 is the next instance of running into the Schroeders. And we find Judah in Europe and uh, specifically in Vienna, Austria. On March 4th, he attended a roundtable about intolerance and discrimination against Christians. This was at the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. So he's listed in the attendance record as an observer from the University of Essex. So evidently, he's doing his graduate work now at the University of Essex in England. Um, Interestingly, another name that jumped out at me in the attendance list was Professor Massimo Introvine. So we know him, he runs the Center for Studies on New Religions in Turin, Italy, known for defending controversial religions, including Scientology. And interestingly, Jehovah's Witnesses hired him recently to defend them. So that's a funny coincidence. Okay, so that was in March of 2009. And then later in 2009, we find that Judah publishes his dissertation at the University of Essex. So it's 118 pages. The title is the Role of Jehovah's Witnesses in the Emergent Right of Conscientious Objection to Military Service in International Law. So basically, it's all about the fact that most all people in prison around the world for conscientious objection is, they are Jehovah's Witnesses. And it's mainly due to South Korea at that point was, was jailing all the witness young men. Yeah, and so he was, talk- he was writing about how that was driving um, policy and law in different parts of the world. So that was his dissertation. And so evidently, I assume he graduated after that with his master's degree. Okay, 2010, we find uh, him pop up in California. And so uh, this mentions that Judah forms a corporation in California called the Ministerial Support Foundation. So... Judah's president. It's no longer an active corporation now. Um, that's about all I know about it. He has connected to some addresses in Fresno. So I don't know what what it was about, but that was a corporation he formed then. 2011. We find uh, Judah pop up in. He has a journal article published in a German academic journal, which is called... Maybe Kirlich Zeitgeschichte or something like that. <laughs> and uh, so this is a uh, academic journal, primarily covers church history of the 20th and 21st centuries. So he publishes a 37 page article with the same title as his thesis, as his dissertation. So evidently, some kind of the full text or a condensation of that uh, dissertation he wrote. Okay, now also in 2011, they pop up in the real estate business. So we find that Judah and Amber buy a condo, number 601, at the Hillsborough Ocean Club in Hillsborough Beach, Florida. So uh, Hillsborough Beach is a, a spot on the east coast of Florida. It's between West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale. And so this uh, condo they buy is beachfront property, they pay $480,000 for this condo. It's 2,350 square feet, three bedroom, two and a half bath, two balconies overlooking the water. The real estate listing says that boat dockage periodically comes available with the condo, but 
bad news, it can only accommodate up to a 36 foot boat. So that's kind of rough, but anyway, so they buy this property. Very interestingly, we actually have a video walkthrough of the property from a few years later from when they put it up for sale again. So let's check out that video. Okay, so pretty cool property, I'm not gonna lie. It looks pretty sweet. Um, and you could even see like the watchtower literature on the bookshelves in the background, so that's kind of interesting. So they buy it in 2011. In 2012, they put it up for sale for like two days, and then they immediately pull it off the market again. So I'm not sure what the scoop was there, but anyways, they kept it after that. Now then we jump forward to 2014, and the Schroders had some custom closets installed in the condo. And the guy, the installer from the company, the closet factory, he had Judah do like a little testimonial of the job they did. So it's a little 30 second video. Let's check that out. Schroeder, we just finished his installation on his brand new closet. What did you think of everything, Mr. Schroeder? Very, very pleased. Uh, we feel that the entire experience uh, was excellent from start to finish. Very professional from the initial uh, design discussions with Dennis uh, and, and uh, designing it exactly as we wanted. A little tweaking along the way right to the installation process today. Uh, they did an excellent job as well. So we felt it was truly a professional experience and we are very satisfied customers. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so this is from 2014, so that's what was going on there. In 2016, the Schroders put the condo up for sale again. So they list it at $925,000, and uh, it, would, it took about a year and a half to sell it, but they did end up selling it. Tragically, they could only get $700,000 for the property. So, yeah, kind of rough, you know? <laughs> So that was 2016. Also in 2016, we find Judah pop up at a listing for a seminar about public speaking in Shanghai, China. So this is kind of interesting. This is a seminar. It was actually canceled, so it wasn't held in the end, but it was all about presentation. And as you read it, uh, you're probably going to get flashbacks because it sounds exactly like the Theocratic Ministry School. So check out the subjects that we're going to cover. Powerful introductions. Closing strong. Highlighting the key message. Mastering pitch, power, and pace of voice. That was burned into my head. Using body language to influence. Use of gestures. Presenting with confidence. So uh, yeah, evidently they were kind of leveraging the whole Theocratic Ministry School 
uh, curriculum in this conference in Shanghai. And uh, they were doing pretty good. It says it was going to cost, when you translate the money, uh, cost $340 for members, $500 for non-members to attend this seminar. And you can see there it lists Mr. Judah Ben Schroeder. It calls him a senior L&D consultant at Compass Corporate Solutions. So I've learned that L&D is for learning and development. And uh, it tells us he has over 25 years of experience in business administration, management training and consulting, media relations, and international law. He's taught seminars in North America, Europe, and Asia to more than 30 different nationalities. He's conducted group training sessions over the course of more than 20 years, focusing primarily on coaching the presenters themselves to be more effective in their delivery, while at the same time being part of a cohesive team. I'm pretty sure they're describing that he was the school overseer of the Theocratic Ministry School at a kingdom hall somewhere. So it's pretty fun to read that, like spin the whole what you can from the witness experience in business terms. And then his, his co-presenter here was a fellow named Mr. Robert Bravo, who is, I think he founded this Compass Corporate Solutions company. And again, similar skill set that Robert Bravo has. That's an awesome name, right? Uh, it mentions he's been facilitating small and large group public speaking seminars for the past 14 years. He grew up in New York City learn the value of communication skills to bridge cultural gaps. He's conducted thousands of communication and leadership training programs in English and Mandarin, ranging from small group coaching to speaking to audiences numbering over 10,000. District convention, anyone? Uh, and so, yeah. So they were going to do their thing there. And as you look at the website for this company, Compass Corporate Solutions, it evidently is one of, it's a witness-owned business, um, not society owned, but owned by witnesses. And I'm assuming most, if not all of the employees are also witnesses. I'd be really interested to learn like the connection. Are they, was it need graders that started this business? Be, um, so they're located in Shanghai and Beijing. And it seems like most of the guys there are, are fluent in more than one language. They speak Mandarin or Japanese. And uh, so I'm not sure if they learned that to, kind of move over and work the, where the need is greater over there. And then they started this business. So anyways, Judah was a consultant for them. Okay. So now we jump forward to 2019 and we find returning to real estate that Judah and Amber bought a condo in 2019. So this is a little more rural area. It's Hobie Sound, Florida. It's a little bit more north of West Palm Beach now. Um, so yeah, we'll look at the papers from here. I might maybe block out the street address. I mean, that, that is hard to find it all, but you know, I'm not trying to dox anybody here. Um, but yeah, so they buy this condo. It's a three bed, three bath, 1900 square feet, much less expensive though, $245,000 for this condo. Now, interestingly, when you look at the real estate paperwork, it lists the buyers as Judah and Amber and Suzanne Baker. So three buyers. So is Suzanne Amber's mom? I'm not totally sure. Maybe. Um, but anyways, the three of them bought this condo in 2019. And then finally, in 2020, we have a data point here that in July 9th, the Schroeders formed a new corporation in Florida. So they called it J.B. Schroeder and Associates, LLC. And uh, Amber and Judah are both listed as directors in this corporation. So again, I'm not sure what the purpose of this corporation is at all, but uh, it exists uh, as of last summer. All right, so that is the scoop on Judah Ben Schroeder, son of Albert Schroeder of the governing body. Uh, I don't really have any grand conclusions about the whole thing. I just think it's a really interesting little slice of Watchtower trivia or history or whatever you want to say. So uh, that's that's the scoop. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Take care. Uh, subscribe if you like, and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye now.